So, all right, so I, I have a number of clients for my consulting business for survival. One of them is a uh, real estate investment banker. So, without giving away too many details, I was in their, their very nice place, having their private chef, and some of you have heard the story, serving us food out of their garden. Uh, very well off, so I created a plan for them. Everything he said was pretty much what you just said. Now, they went a little bit further to say, um, they agreed with you that anything digital financial is a bad idea terrible idea, similar to the Cypress haircutting and all that other kind of stuff they felt was going to be an issue. But they went on to say that the SDRs might become the new currency after a major, because it's not going to be just a local, it's just not going to be an American collapse, it's going to be a global issue, like you talked about with the contagion. And that the SDRs might become the note of currency going forward after all this settles, and they have to let it, well, like you said, wash out to restart the system. What is your opinion on that? For those of you who don't know, an SDR is a special drawing right uh, issued by the International Monetary Fund. I have, uh, I think Brandon Smith of altmarket.com is a big proponent of that theory that this crisis will lead the way to global financial governance and so on and so forth. Um, I think one of the reasons that this, cri that this crisis will be substantial is because the world is devolving. There is no center anymore. We all have our, our huge computer power, our huge weaponry power or whatnot. I don't think that an enraged global <coughs> populace, that they're going to be able to superimpose something like a brand new global currency or whatnot. I could be wrong, but uh, to get people to accept that, to get our community, the preppers, to accept that, I don't think it's going to happen. Um, I, I, uh, I think we've reached the apex of government centralization. I don't think we see globalism in one world go, uh, government, and I've written a lot more about this uh, if you want to get on the site. But so it's a it's a possibility. You know, it's a contingency you have to think about, but uh, it's not something that keeps me up at night. Well, these are like uber wealthy investment banker types that I'm sitting there talking personally with so that's why I'm asking this is not just a Facebook conversation with you know, everybody's panicking about stuff. Um, I had conversations in 2006, 2007 with the uber wealthy investment banker types. The housing crisis is nothing. It won't be systemic. Um, they're uber wealthy, they're smart, but they're not omniscient. You mentioned about the banks, like Lehman, Lehman Brothers was not bailed out, but other banks were bailed out. Or forced into mergers. Or yeah. forced into mergers. Could you explain to people who financed that? Yeah. We're looking at it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it I mean, it, and I've seen estimates that range from anywhere to 2 to $12 trillion was spent by the government. And that's still a very hard number to find out is just how much got spent on bailouts, how much the government got in return for what they got when they bailed the companies out. Still a lot of mystery about that. But yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I should have mentioned that in the speech. Yeah, the bailouts came from us, anybody who pays taxes. That leads directly into something that I've been thinking about for about half of your speech. The disconnect between the financial state of the world the amount of money that's in circulation, government controlled or whatnot, versus what GDP actually is, which is a unit of labor from the population. And you know, that's fundamentally where all this stuff that people are trying to sell and trade, you were talking about the toilet paper issue before, you know, that stuff comes from people's work. So at a personal level, your wealth comes from your labor. Any debt you have is future labor to earn that money to then pay it back. Governments have disconnected their supply of money from their population's uh, productivity. And it wasn't the focus of your speech, but this latest push to move populations around the planet is intricately related to the fact that they have money that nobody can borrow. And now you have new populations coming in that have zero debt balance that they can now force the money into and you know have new debt capital. How, how much do you think the people who are pushing these uh, economic models are also pushing these immigration models. To me it all seems like 
one one group. Mm -hmm. You know, the people who are talking about one one globalism and whatnot are all pushing the immigration for whatever specious reasons they, they push it. Um, so, you know, if, if it's not one group, there's a huge amount of overlap. Well, <clears throat> excellent presentation. I really enjoyed it. Uh, Thank you. The, uh, of course, the, the response to the collapse can either be hyperinflation or deinflation or deflation. Uh, what do you think might be the response to the coming collapse and what would be the precursors that would tip the balance between inflation and, and deflation? Well, I, I think. Uh, I think debt collapses are inherently deflationary. You have what is used as, imagine a pure money system where you cut the money supply in half. What does that do to an economy? You get a debt implosion, you might cut what's used as money by 70, 80%. That's deflationary. There's right. no way you're going to avoid deflationary. Well, that's what should have happened in 2008. Well, we did get, we did, you know, you got a huge deflation in financial asset prices, which is where you had had the huge inflation going into 2008. So yeah, there was all sorts of deflation. My guru on this, and I'm, I'm going to put in a plug for him and his book, is Robert Prechter, because I've been following his career for 30 years. He's down in Gainesville, Georgia. Um, and you don't have to get into the weeds of his method of analysis. Uh, I will recommend the book. Conquer the Crash, the latest edition, all sorts of helpful information, all sorts of helpful background and perspective. Um, What's that author again? Robert Prechter. I'm sorry, I should put that up there. He has a website, Elliott Wave International, uh, that is mostly for fee. Um, I've made enough off of him through the years that I've paid for my subscription for the rest of my life. Um, he's had some fabulous market calls like anybody else who tries to predict these things. He's, he's been wrong on occasion, but he's gotten all the big, big moves correct. What about invested money? What? What about invested money? Like holdings with groups like Edward Jones or, or something. What do we do with that money? Because in 2008, we dropped about 30% of our retirement that they, they hold for us. Now we, we gained some of that back, but it sounds to me like the next one is going to take a bigger chunk of that. What, what do you suggest about invested money? Um. You'll kind of see it coming, um, and you're going to want to panic a little bit. But the key to panicking is to panic before everybody else. Okay, you want to take your money out of the account. Okay, and you want to convert some of it to goods, and you're going to want to convert some of it to cash, and some of it to gold and silver. Um, you know, the actual bad part of the financial crisis. You had like a year, year and a half warning. Bear Stearns had it. Actually, had it. housing prices topped. Um, I would say you're going to get a pretty good indication that, that things are wrong when, when the government bond market starts really falling apart. Topped out in June, July of 2016, and interest rates have been trending irregularly uh, upward ever since. But when that one starts hitting an inflection point, I'd start getting worried because it means creditors are getting nervous about what's supposedly the most credit worthy credit out there, the U.S. government. So keep an eye on that. that that's going to be kind of the canary in the coal mine. Is there a plateau in real estate at that same time or did it just... I think we're starting to see real estate plateau, at least in the areas where it's been blown up the most. New York rents and for sale on the condos and stuff has fallen apart. Seattle. San Francisco are all, all seem to be cresting right about now. 
And is that what we saw last time? That's what the question was. Oh, yeah. Oh, they, yeah, they collapsed. Okay, one more question. Just just because you had a, okay. you already had a question. Anybody got a question besides? Okay, go ahead. Does anybody see this coming in a meaningful way that there's a solution on the horizon that doesn't involve more of the same? And then the related, who or does anybody have a vested interest in trying to implement that in any way that might possibly preclude some of the worst possible scenarios? Well, I mean, that's a question every time we've had one of these. Are they going to be able to rescue? But it seems like the only answer is the same. More Keynesian economics, print, you know, put more money in the open. Oh, yeah. No, they, they there is no, I mean, the solution is to let it happen. Yeah. Let it wash out. And nobody wants to let that happen. Absolutely not. <laughs> you know, nobody has a vested interest in the way things are. Yeah, so they point will point try point. to do more of the same. You might see the Fed balance sheet go from, you know, four trillion to 10 trillion or 15 trillion. I mean, they will do, because that's all they can do. The system has no ability to self-reflect and say, we've got to try something, and then there's nobody actually pushing to do that in any meaningful way. No, the one system that has an ability to self-correct is capitalism. You wash things out, debts get written down, debts get absolved, assets change hands, you, re you set the stage for the next advance. That's capitalism. Okay. But government? I, the only thing government has is a gun and a printing press, figuratively speaking, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. It's a big gun. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me.